Hello. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming to this panel to listen uh, to the officially titled, and I quote, long-awaited, quote, non-voluntary use of patents in court cases involving requests for permanent injunctions as a remedy to infringement under the standards set out, I need some water, by the United States Supreme Court in eBay versus Merck Exchange, and we even have a little site in the heading, 547 US 388 in 2006. I like to simply call it compulsory licensing issues and patent infringement, but you can choose either one when you talk about what happened here today. It is my honor to be here today with uh, such distinguished panelists and very interesting um, uh, uh, different industry and scholars that are here today to talk about these issues. My name is Hilary Brill. I am currently the practitioner in residence at American University's College of Law. I teach intellectual property classes and I teach technology policy classes. I happen to also be specifically interested in this panel because in one of my previous roles, I had been at eBay for 10 years. I was their head of government relations and I was their global intellectual property policy council. I happened to be at eBay in 2006 during the eBay versus Merck exchange case. So I can provide a little bit of a different perspective, hopefully um, as a moderator in this panel and uh, let you know what a practitioner's view of this case um, might have been, for, if you'll just indulge me for about a minute and a half and then we will get to our distinguished panelists. In 2006, I was able to actually sit in the Supreme Court and watch the arguments uh, in front of the justices. And if you recall or don't know, and I won't go into the details of the case because our panelists might, but at that time, eBay wanted to use and was using a feature called Buy It Now. Now it was 2006 and 30% of eBay's actual listings were buy it now um, or had buy it now capability. Now I don't know what the recent statistics are but it's much, much greater. eBay was trying to transition out of just being an auction type of website. People wanted instant gratification to continue to be competitive. They wanted to use buy it now. Merck Exchange owned a patent for a buy it now feature. eBay wanted to use that and went into negotiations with Merck Exchange. Then that stopped. Merck Exchange sued eBay, which brings us to where we are here today. eBay lost the case. However, it did set up a precedent for injunctions that technology and e-commerce industries still rely on and use in many ways today. It created, and I won't go into detail, but the four-factor injunction test. Um, if I get this correct, I believe it includes irreparable harm, or they call it injury, public interest, the balancing of hardships, and whether or not you can have adequate monetary um, compensation for what's at issue. So what happened was eBay lost, but they didn't have to stop by now. So for all of you people who use eBay, and if you don't, go check it out, you still can use buy it now because the court decided that under this injunction, standard if eBay paid, they could continue to use this. Now in the e-commerce sector, as I said, that was a movement um, forward. It was a, a loss and a victory. And in the technology sector, it's a question of innovators versus competitors and who gets to use a patent. In technology products, you can have hundreds, maybe thousands of patents in one product, like in, your, you know, in a smartphone or in a watch. But you guys are here to talk about something much more important. You're here to talk about medical patents in devices or in pharmaceuticals where just one patent can make the difference between receiving access to life-saving medicine or life-saving medical devices. So that's the perspective from a technology practitioner, but you're here to hear these distinguished panelists. And it really is my pleasure to introduce Andrew, Andrew S. Goldman. He is the Council for Policy and Legal Affairs at KEI. He is an attorney in Maryland and New York, and he's admitted before the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. At KEI, Andrew 
provides integral legal analysis to support KEI's advocacy work, including domestic statutory and regulatory issues, uh, including those related um, to government rights and federally funded patents, and internationally on various trade agreements such as TTIP, TPP, and RCEP, as well as on compulsory licensing requests on multiple continents involving expensive medicines for hepatitis C virus and cancer. Prior to joining KEI, Andrew was an associate for IP in Baltimore, where he practiced copyright and trademark in litigation and transactional work. Andrew is a graduate of University of Maryland School of Law. He received his MA from Columbia and graduated with a BA in politics from Princeton University. Our second speaker, Professor, Ra Professor Rachel Sachs, is a scholar of innovation policy whose work explores the interaction of intellectual property law, food and drug regulation, and health law. Her work explores problems of innovation and access considering how law helps or hinders these problems. Professor Sachs' scholarship has or will appear in journals that include Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, the University of California Davis Law Review, the Yale Journal of Law and Technology, and the peer-reviewed Journal of Law and Biosciences. Prior to joining faculty, Professor Sachs was an academic fellow at the Center for Health and Law Policy, Biotechnology, and bioethics and a lecturer of law at Harvard Law School. She also clerked for the Honorable Richard Posner of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She received her J.D. magna cum laude from Harvard Law School and a Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She received her A.B. in bioethics from Princeton University. And our last speaker, Matthew Herper. Did I say that correctly? Oh, I'm so glad. He is currently and has been for quite some time. I, is it 17 years at Forbes? Is my research correct? <laughs> he was two when he started. Um, he's the, currently the senior editor at Forbes magazine, and I quote himself, and I found this. He says that, I believe this is biology's century. <laughs> Did you? I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> he has covered science and medicine from the Human Genome Project through Biox to blossoming DNA technology changing the world today. He consistently covers biotech and pharmaceutical industry and is one of the most prominent journalists in this space. In fact, I found out by some of my little research that he was named one of the top writers to follow, um, particularly for his blog on the drug business. The Medicine Show, which is your blog or is that your... Okay, well, I found it looking for some information, and it has been called essential reading for anyone trying to make sense out of today's headlines. So if you don't have it anymore, I think you need to bring it back for well, essential it's headlines. It's, it's Got it. Got it. So we are lucky to have him here today because he can help us with the essential headlines. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers to discuss a compulsory license and patent infringement issues, particularly with your experiences. And Andrew, I believe you're going to be first. Hello. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about eBay compulsory licenses. As uh, Hillary just said, judicially mandated licenses post eBay versus Merck Exchange. And today we, we just want to focus on medical technology patents. There's a lot even in that sentence, so I just kind of want to start. I know that we have a lot of lawyers and professors in the room, but for, there's some that aren't. So let's just back up and start from the very beginning. Um, we're talking about patent infringement cases here. Um, and we're talk, when we're talking about eBay compulsory licenses, we're talking about um, the questions of, of injunction and when an injunction is going to be denied. So what's an injunction? An injunction is basically a court order to refrain from doing something. When we're talking about damages, we're talking about, typically talking about money, um, monetary damages. So the rule before eBay, just to really go back, um, the general rule in patent infringement was monetary damages for past harm plus a permanent injunction going forward. An injunction being a, a sort of forward-thinking remedy. And then in the, in the case of eBay, and uh, Hillary talked about it a little bit, I just 
I'll walk through it really fast. Um, it's a patent infringement case. Merck Exchange had a business method patent that was sort of similar to what eBay was doing. It's a, for an electronic market designed to facilitate the sale of goods between private individuals. Um, Merck Exchange tried to license the patent to eBay. They failed to reach an agreement. They sued eBay in the Eastern District in Virginia. At the district court level, they, they were found, uh, eBay had found to, uh, was found to have infringed. Um, there was damages awarded, but there was no permanent injunction. Um, at the appellate level, the Federal Circuit reversed, and they applied that general rule that I just mentioned about injunctions. They, so they, they granted uh, the permanent injunction. And then it was taken up to the Supreme Court, where the question was really whether that, per, that rule about injunctions was appropriate for, for patent infringement. And the Supreme Court ruled for, for eBay on this. E eBay tried, e eBay argued that a traditional four-factor test, which Hillary mentioned, um, using principles of equity, or just principles of fairness, should apply to cases of in patent infringement. And so this, this is the four-factor test. For permanent injunction, the plaintiff has to demonstrate irreparable injury. The, the remedies at, at law, for example, monetary damages, are inadequate to compensate for the injury. That the remedy in equity is warranted after a balance of hardships. So basically just balancing the arguments of which side would be harmed um, if an injunction is granted or if it's not granted and the public interest, that the public interest would not be deserved by a permanent injunction. And the court ruled for eBay, and they held that the four-factor test here would apply to Patent Act disputes. So why is this important in the context of what we're talking about? Um, so injunction after this case is, is no longer the default remedy for patent infringement. Um, and, and when an injunction is denied, it allows the continued infringing use of the patent in exchange for a running royalty. And there are quite a few cases where this has happened, where courts have denied the injunction and granted a compulsory license for the patents at issue. Um, eBay compulsory license is just a, a general, I think Fred will later talk a lot about the TRIPS, uh, WTO TRIPS agreement, but these compulsory licenses would, would fall under Article 44 of that agreement on injunctions. Um, that's in part three on the enforcement of intellectual property rights. In paragraph one of article 44, it provides that judicial authorities shall have the authority to order a party to desist from an infringement, so basically to enjoin them. And in paragraph two, that members can limit the remedies available against such use to payment of remuneration. And article 45 on damages is also relevant here. Um, for examples of, of how this has played out in, in the courts uh, on cases of, of medical technology patents, there's, there are lots. This is not an exclusive list, but you can see there have been cases having to do with uh, oral contraceptives, arthroscopic surgical instruments, transcervical contraceptive devices, uh, things for cardio surgery, transcatheter heart valves, surgical spine devices, grafts, hep C diagnostic tests, and so on. Um, so I, I just wanted to walk through a few cases to demonstrate how this has worked. Um, this is a case called Bard Peripheral Vascular versus W. L. Gore and Associates. It's from 2009 um, from the uh, district court in Arizona, the federal court. Um, it's a good case to look at in terms of how the court looks at the public interest when we're talking about medical technology patents. Here, this was a patent infringement case that had to do with cardio technologies, grafts, cardiovascular patches, stent grafts. Um, so the, the, uh, on the motion for injunction, the injunction was denied. Um, the court focused on two of the four factors in particular, the inadequate remedy at law um, and the public interest. Um, they, the courts, if, as far as the inadequate remedy at law, the court said that a fair and full amount of compensatory mon money damages, which here was about $185 million, when combined with a progressive compulsory license will adequately compensate plaintiff's injuries, such that the harsh and extraordinary remedy of injunction with its potentially devastating public health consequences can be avoided. And the public interest um, factor, the district court said that the 
potential disruption in the availability of the product to thousands of cardiovascular patients was, was going to be a, a real problem. And there's a, there's a long quote here. I won't read the whole thing, but the point is that the, the court was saying that the risk is too great. Uh, placing Gore's infringing products out of reach of the surgeons who rely on them would only work to deny many sick patients a full range of clinically effective and potentially life-saving treatments. Um, the royalty rate in this case was set at between 12.5% and 20%, depending on the type of the product. Um, it was affirmed on appeal. Um, and then in rehearing on banc, it was vacated only as to the, the willfulness of the infringement, but this part of the ruling stands. Um, the next case is uh, Edwards Life Sciences versus Corval. Um, this is kind of this is an interesting case from 2011, uh, the federal court in Delaware. Um, this has to do with transcatheter heart valves. Um, core valve was found to have infringed. Edwards was awarded $72 million in lost profits and a $1.3 million reasonable royalty. The injunction was denied. Um, and the court, I'm not going to read you all of this, but uh, we'll circulate this stuff later so you can, you can look at it if you're interested. But um, the court was, in this case, uh, particularly interested in the arguments having to do with core valve just packing up and moving to Mexico if an injunction were granted, which is kind of relevant in our uh, President Trump universe right now. But um, the, 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 in, the, um, in the public interest factor, um, you can see that the court said the public interest would not be substantially advanced or harmed by the issuance of an injunction since core valve would be able to continue manufacturing the accused product abroad without seriously affecting the supply of the product available to the public. Um, this, was, this was a case entirely about manufacturing. There were actually no sales of the infringing product in the United States. Um, and a lot of it really had to do with kind of sloppy, I shouldn't say sloppy, but um, the, the failure to build out an evidentiary record um, and that's something that you'll see in, in a lot of these cases where, you know, Edwards um, try, argued things, speculate, speculated a lot of things, but didn't really produce evidence. Uh, the next case, Conceptus versus Hologic. Um, this is a case from 2012. Um, this had to do with a transcervically introduced permanent contraception system. Um, this was, uh, this injunction was denied um, the court primarily for, looked at the last three. The first, the irreparable harm factor actually weighed in favor of an injunction. But um, again, it came back to this issue of the clear public health benefits, the public interest, the clear public health benefits from having a choice of different products with different qualities, and what would happen if you, if you removed one of them. And in, in particularly here, this was a, a case where there's, there was only two products on the entire market for this. Um, the case ultimately settled after all this, and it, they, they agreed to a 5% running royalty. Um, next case, I'm, I'm almost, not too much more of this. Um, Smith and Nephew versus Interlace. Uh, this is a case from 2013. Um, the patents had to do with an arthroscopic surgical instrument, a surgical endoscopic cutting device, and the method for its use. Um, the, on the motion for injunction, there was sort of a, the court found the first two actually weighed slightly in favor of the injunction, but the last two um, really, really weighed against it. And um, the, in the public interest factor, um, they noted that um, the defendant's evidence of the, the negative impact to doctors and patients, so if they actually were to have granted this, um, would outweigh the plaintiff's evidence that there were no clinical studies showing any advantage over, of the one product over the other. Uh, and the court said that because different doctors may find one device or the other more suitable for particular uh, intrauterine tissue procedures, health providers and patients benefit substantially from having both products available to the market. Um, the, this is a case of Bayer versus uh, Watson. This is from last year. Um, and it had to do with an oral contraceptive. Uh, the permanent injunction, motion for permanent injunction was denied. Um, this was a case where Watson had not actually yet introduced its generic. They had filed um, an ANDA. 
Um, and the main factors in this case were actually the first two. This is kind of, it's kind of interesting because this, is, this demonstrates that not every court is going to look at the public interest the same way. Um, th in this one, they actually said that the public interest weighed slightly in favor of Bayer. And the court was, they said that, okay, there's a public benefit to having an earlier launch of a generic, but the court was actually more focused in the importance of protecting the patent, the validity of patent and encouraging investment. So there's actually the first two factors in this one um, that swayed it. Um, this is actually a trade secrets case, and I just wanted to put this one up here just to illustrate that this is, uh, it had to do with um, a transcatheter mitral valve, so still t med medical technology patent issues, but this was a trade, a trade secret case, just to say that this four-factor test has applied beyond patents, um, and just to sort of demonstrate how that has worked. Um, and you, you can, I'm not going to read all this, but again, just sort of focusing, look at the, the public interest. Both companies had prototypes, um, and the court, uh, I believe they denied the injunction in this case. They, they said that if they were to have granted the injunction, um, it would have imposed uh, an 18-month delay in the progress of one transcatheter mitral valve device that works, and thereby keep a life-saving device off the market for an additional year and a half. Um, and that is it. I, th this is, I didn't want to overstate this. There are plenty of cases where injunctions are granted, but um, this was just to sort of illustrate how these things have worked. And um, thank you very much. It was the last person, sorry. Uh, so I don't have slides. Um, Andrew has very helpfully gone through a number of the relevant cases in this area, and um, I'm going to focus in on one of the prongs of the eBay test, specifically the public interest prong, and consider the ways in which uh, courts are applying this prong, what they're doing, and then what should they be doing. So um, I have to say I haven't read every case involving injunctions because there's a lot of them, although I like to think I've read most of the ones involving medical patents. Uh, and then eventually, essentially what's going on is that courts do not treat this prong of the test very seriously, especially as compared to the other prongs of the test. They often spend a lot of time talking about adequacy of damages or irreparable harm, um, but they don't spend very much time on the public interest factor in a way that I think is problematic. And so uh, something that is very common to see, not so much in um, the medical sector, but in uh, cases involving other types of patents, is that the court just asserts that there's a public interest in a well-functioning patent system and then sort of moves on, uh, which is interesting but not very satisfying. It feels really incomplete. Uh, in health-related cases, though, there's a couple of different kinds of things the courts do. And actually, Andrew, can I go back through your slides? Sure. Okay. Um, so, so this is an example of one of them, right? This Bayer case uh, is one about, um, you said it's an ANDA, right? It's a case involving a generic and a branded company. Um, and courts will often acknowledge the needs of patients here, right? It's typically placed um, as against the interests of having a well-functioning patent system, um, but often the analysis looks something like this. So there's um, a District of Maryland case that I like from a couple of years ago in which uh, Par Pharmaceuticals is suing a generic company about a drug that treats um, unexplained weight loss, uh, and they want to know whether we're going to allow the generic on the market, and the court, they get to the public interest prong and they say three sentences. They say, the court recognizes that the public is served by the availability of low-cost generic medications. Great start. On the other hand, the public also has an interest in the protection of valid patents because it promotes innovation. This factor, therefore, is neutral. That's it. 
so this is sort of similar, right? And, and they say here, in this case, the Andrews going over that it's slightly weighted in favor of Bayer, whereas the court in my case said it was neutral. But they sort of do this, right? They say on the one hand, we've got patents. And on the other hand, we've got the needs of patients in this particular area. And those are both really important. And what do we do? And how do we know? So they don't do a lot more uh, deeper investigation of the question. Now, there are other cases which weigh these factors and find in favor of uh, the defendants in particular. So uh, this is one of them, the Smith and Nephew case that Andrew went over, as is this Conceptus case. Uh, these are mostly cases that are between two branded competitors or would-be competitors, depending on what stage uh, we get the opinion at. Um, and I think Matt is going to talk about the case that was recently decided between the PCSK9 manufacturers, right, where we have a court um, looking at these two companies which have different branded products competing in the market and they say yes there's a traditional notion that being a patent holder is really important and we want to value that and it matters in the public interest analysis but also in that case what the court said was the public generally is better served by having a choice of available treatments and so you see that here um, in this case that Andrew is citing and you also see that here in the Smith and Nephew case. So the court, in some cases, ultimately grants the injunction, like in the one that, that Matt is going to discuss, and in some of these cases doesn't grant the injunction because there are, of course, three other factors to this test, and the court has to figure out how these shake out as against each other. Um, but the opinion may, in fact, say that the public interest weighs in favor of the defendant infringers. Uh, there's a handful of really old cases I like to look at in thinking about what kinds of factors the courts care about. Um, so there's a couple of cases, a Hybrotech v. Abbott and Vitamin Technologist v. Wharf, where the court denies an injunction but says it's doing so only because the patentee isn't marketing the technology itself. And so this is the only way the public will be able to access the invention in question. This is a little bit strange if you're a patent law person because uh, other countries have something called the patent working requirement, right, where basically the idea is if you have a patent on a particular technology, you have to practice that patent within the country. And if you don't, there's either forfeiture of the patent or a compulsory license is issued. But the U.S. hasn't had a working requirement for a very, very long time. And, and going back to something Zach said uh, much earlier in the day, when it did, I think it was only against uh, foreigners. So there are some ways in which we've structured the laws in, in certain ways. And people didn't believe that it was going to be held only against foreigners, so we got rid of it. I'm not sure if that's why. Um, but it's odd to see courts granting what is essentially a compulsory license to these patents where the patentee isn't practicing them because I thought we'd gotten rid of that. Um, and I do want to be clear about this because technically this is about injunctions, but we're, we are talking about compulsory licenses, right? When we tell a patent holder that we're going to give them a judicially determined amount of damages, but we're not going to give them an injunction, we've taken their right to exclude. That's what we're doing here. But by contrast, I do have to recognize that granting an injunction doesn't mean the case stops, right? It doesn't mean the losing party won't be able to sell, this, uh, sell its product. We often do have settlements, uh, and it's just that the parties are bargaining against a much different backdrop, against a much different bargaining position of the two parties in which the patent holder can demand a much larger share of money in exchange for the license. Uh, the other cases, which I, I have to mention because they're they have really great facts are the sewage cases. Um, so one of the cases that gets cited a lot in the literature is from 1934, City of Milwaukee v. Activated Sludge. Uh, the Activated Sludge Company sues the City of Milwaukee for infringing its patent on a method of treating sewage. And they win on the infringement ground. But the Seventh Circuit says, no, you can't have an injunction because if we give you an injunction, Quote, it would close the sewage plant, leaving the entire community without any means for the disposal of raw sewage other than running it into Lake Michigan, thereby polluting its waters and endangering the health and lives of that and other communities. And we think that's bad, right? To be clear, we think that's bad. Um, uh, and other than that analysis, which actually is quite detailed, it's also quite old, um, many of these analyses are quite superficial. So when the courts are thinking through the public interest analysis, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, information, which is the one where you talk about how 
the parties didn't introduce information. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, framework to give content to their analysis. And then also the parties don't present evidence uh, on these questions a lot of the time. So the courts really don't have a sense of what's going on and what they should be doing. And I do think they're hitting on a lot of really good, important things. So I would agree that you know, paying attention to whether the patentee is actually marketing their own project, a product is actually practicing the invention. As a normative matter, that seems to me like a pretty good rule of thumb in considering whether the public interest would be served by granting an injunction. Uh, but more generally, in, in my view and in the view of other scholars to have looked at this question, uh, courts can and should do a lot more analytical work in deciding this and other aspects of the injunction standard. So they should be asking questions like how many people are affected. So as we see in the sewage cases, when it's entire cities or municipalities who would be affected, that makes courts really nervous. But that's a case where they can see it. They're all in one place. There's a particular identified population. Whereas when there's some people spread out or it affects a smaller number of people but in a more concentrated way, courts have difficulty seeing that and figuring it out. And so maybe when we're considering whether there's a condition that affects a lot of people to some degree or a smaller number more severely, that should matter to courts. Uh, second, who are the people that are affected? Uh, I wouldn't be shocked in some of these cases to find that the burden of the injunction will fall most heavily on the poor and otherwise marginalized, and that worries me if it doesn't, uh, as a doctrinal matter, have to worry the courts. Third, what will be the effect on these people if we grant the injunction, which is sort of the ultimate question at the heart of the public interest analysis. And so here I'm envisioning something more than what the court in the PCSK9 uh, case says when they say that the public interest is served when there's a choice of available treatments. So the court can ask a lot more specific questions like what is going to happen to patient care, right? At least some patients may go without the drug during a transition period. How does that tell us what the shape of any sort of remedy should look like, whether or not we end up granting it? Um, if there's a generic or a branded competitor already on the market and we kick them off, what does that do to the price of the first innovator product? How should we think about that? How do we think about insurance companies who have negotiated contracts with one uh, with a provider who's now going to get kicked off the market, what does that do? Uh, and I don't think there are clear-cut answers to how the courts should um, answer the public interest prong and answer the injunction question as a whole if we know the answers to these questions. I think it's complicated and fact-intensive. And this actually gives me pause about what I'm saying, right? Because we don't... Uh, uh, Sometimes we're nervous about the capacities of courts to resolve some of these questions. And so if you give them an expensive, fact-intensive inquiry to do on top of the analyses they're already doing, we might have concerns about whether the courts should be doing this, whether their accuracy would be improved relative to the current situation in which they sort of say some platitudes and then they throw their hands up. But a lot of these questions are pretty easy to answer and the courts can understand them and they should be making a more informed decision even if it's not quite as principled as we might like. Uh, one thing I do have to say, because there is something about this idea that worries uh, me, in a way, it doesn't worry everyone here, and I know you're going to yell at me during the Q&A, which is fine. Um, but I do worry sometimes that we're punishing the companies who have already done the right thing. Uh, so if you have a company um, you know, like Gilead who has made a cure for a chronic disease, um, and we say to them and only to them, we're going to take your right to exclude because you affect so many people and they're poor and marginalized, right? They take off all of the factors that I have suggested. Um, I worry that it for encourages companies on the front end to make different choices going forward because I like to yell at the companies who aren't in this space in the first instance, but not everybody does, and it doesn't get quite as much notice. So um, it's one of the reasons I think we should be careful in figuring out this analysis because if you just run it sort of mechanically, um, it ends up that the companies we want to be doing the most work going forward get um, hit the hardest with this sort of remedy. Uh, so more generally in figuring out when courts should determine that the public interest lies in favor of one party or the other, there are these additional pieces of information that courts should have but don't uh, and that weigh in favor 
um, of enabling them to figure out what should be done. So if you've got two competing branded products, we can set out a framework for them to figure out what they should be doing. And that might be different than a case in which you've got a generic trying to come on the market um, and you've got a choice between a generic and a branded product. We might ask questions about what weight we should be giving to the behavior of the defendant as well as the plaintiff. Uh, and it's hard to say what courts should be doing um, definitively, but it's also not really possible to defend the proposition that this is sort of the right way to do it. And so shifting towards a more informed system where the courts have more information about what they're doing um, does have some procedural costs, but I think it has real informational value as well. Cool. Thank you. All right, I also don't have slides, and forgive me, but I am a journalist. Um, and uh, that means that I've approached a lot of these issues with a very different uh, mindset. One of the reasons you become a journalist is because you're interested in who covers science and law. It's because you're interested in science and law, but really kind of only the first chapter. Um, and it, you're a bit impatient with all of it. Um, and what I really do is I cover, uh, I've, what I've been doing for all this time is I cover companies. And what I've seen, uh, what I know about patents comes from looking at it from the perspective of someone who looks at these entities that develop drugs, sell them, market them, sometimes over-market them, sometimes they're wonderful, sometimes they're horrible. But, And I've found that it's very useful in covering these areas to kind of go back to first principles and ask what the heck is this patent supposed to do and is it useful? Not just does it confirm to the law or can I get some experts on the phone, but what is this company I cover who's asserting a right trying to do? Can I explain in plain English? And why does this company that thinks they don't have that right have it? That long preamble going back to cases that I can remember, one of which was Pfizer on erectile dysfunction drugs, where, um, which I didn't look up before coming here, but where companies were accused of patenting here. That if you have a patent that's too broad, you can't invent any drugs, because one company owns it. The same issues that we're seeing with the CRISPR cases now. What upset me about the, um, the stay in the Regeneron Amgen case, Regeneron Sanofi Amgen case, that that was the most recent example of this. And what surprised me was that um, it seemed like the court had gotten a lot of the impact of what they were proposing backwards to me at the time. Now, as a spoiler, that injunction that has been stayed, things are progressing exactly how, as I, as a, someone who watches the space, would kind of expect them to progress, which is the drugs are staying on the market and we're going to have a patent case unless they settle. And maybe you can read this injunction, injunction as just a way of telling the folks at Regeneron that you guys better be really sure about this or you better work out a settlement because these are the stakes and, and putting some pressure on them to, to make this whole thing go away. This is a case where we have two drugs. Um, that do essentially the same thing, but have some important clinical differences that are mainly the result of how they were studied. Um, one can be given in a lower dose than the other. Uh, that mean the decision of the court was that there was no public good in those differences. But what bothers me as someone who covers the industry is I know that if you take that first drug off the market, temporarily, you're probably not getting it back. It's an irreversible decision. Um, I've heard some counter arguments from executives in the industry that you need to be so certain of your IP and that, uh, that this makes it more likely that people are going to try to bring drugs that are exactly like yours and maybe Amgen has a point. But the thing that was upsetting about the injunction was that it was essentially making a permanent decision not to give patients a medicine they needed. Um, and to remove a situation, the whole argument Amgen made that there was irreparable harm was that there would be price negotiation between the two drugs, and because there was competition, their drug would be cheaper. 
And because you don't know how much more they could charge for it without the competitor existing, you can't judge what a monetary damage would be. I mean, by that standard, you can never have, you can never leave a competitor on the market. So um, that was upsetting as an injunction. The, the plea I'd make to people is that I do think, having covered this industry for a long time, I hear a lot of assertions that it's not true that you need these patents to, um, Develop drugs. I got in an argument on Twitter with a guy who was tipped to be the FDA commissioner at one point about this topic, and he was arguing that we've never really done the experiment of what a drug market looks like without patents. I'd submit that we have. We have a supplement industry, develops very little of value. We have a, we have drug businesses in places like India where patents were completely not enforced. We can argue that, they should, that there are cases where they shouldn't be enforced or you should have walk-ins. But those markets haven't developed a lot of innovation. Uh, the cases where we've had innovation are the cases where there are barriers. And sadly, when people jack up the prices, um, more companies follow them in, in a gold rush mentality to create more drugs. So you are funding innovation by raising prices. That just, the problem is you just have to decide what it is you want to buy. Um, that's all I have to say. I'd rather move to Q&A. Uh, thanks for having me. It was I have a loud voice, but I guess not. Oh, it's for you guys. Hello. Um, th first of all, thank you all for your presentations, and I think they complemented each other very well. Um, uh, for what it's worth, I did. Uh, I, I just want to add something to uh, eBay's perspective on on the case because because Andrew said we won, and I said we didn't win. Um, yes, at the Supreme Court, we won the injunction, but to us as a company, us, I'm not even there. eBay as a company at the time felt that the fact that someone did not use the patent made it that much more frustrating to actually um, have to pay them for the patent. And you talked about it briefly. I think you did. One of, one of you guys talked about that briefly. And I, I would like your thoughts perhaps on the, the, the patent trolls. I mean, that was an issue that was, you know, it's a policy issue. But in medical patents, um, w what is the situation with whether you want to call them patent trolls or use different language, um, and, and in terms of perhaps your knowledge of court cases, how is that treated? Should it be treated differently? Any thoughts about that perspective of um, the calculus in determining who gets access to, to which patent and how to use it? Yeah, so uh, I will say there are some scholars who've written about the idea of bio patent trolls, uh, but it hasn't really been a widespread thing in the way that it is in many other industries, most, most notably right business methods or software patents. Uh, and you know, to that extent, the public interest analysis uh, may also look a little bit different. You know, the public interest in the buy it now is you have to do the auction or something, I suppose, whereas the, the public interest in, in this case is, you know, you don't get to find out that you have this horrible genetic condition or you don't get treated for it or whatever it is. Uh, and courts, I think, uh, appropriately recognize that there may be a difference there, but it is just one of four um, factors to consider. So there's some people who think there are biopatent trolls, but it is a relatively uncommon thing. Yeah. But imagine, just to use that dumb journalist, imagine a company uh, having a patent for a drug that was available from someone else in blocking. Um, I mean, which the reason the Regenerate Amgen case was so surprising, one reason is that I've had people in the business telling me that this doesn't happen. One, Bob Nelson, who's a venture capitalist who's founded a lot of companies 
founded Illumina, which is the big DNA sequencer maker, founded the company that makes Flumis, the nose spray flu vaccine that turns out doesn't work. Um, but he, he's, he, I was talking to him about this with relation to cancer treatments, CAR T cells, and he said, Matt, no judge is going to tell you not to give the sick kid the drug. No one's going to tell you we have this amazing cancer cure and you can't give it to them. They're just going to make you pay a royalty. So, didn't wasn't true in this case, and then it was, and maybe it won't be. But uh, could the panelists react to the public interest analysis in a case where, on the CRISPR type patents, where the NIH funded the research of people that hold uh, at the Broad Institute in Berkeley? Uh, the development of the patents. The patents themselves aren't products. There's almost no investment. They essentially just assign those to companies whose job it is to sue people or license people to use the patents. And yet they, 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 they deny the public that, uh, or even other companies the freedom to use those tools to develop products in different therapy areas. What, would the, what, would the, what should a judge look at if there was a, a case where somebody was seeking sort of uh, essentially the right to infringe patents going forward in order to develop a product where they couldn't get a license from the Broad Institute because they'd, uh, or Berkeley, because that they'd assign it on an exclusive basis for that therapy area to a different company. So, is it, your question is how should the court address the public interest factor for, in those cases? In those cases. Um, well, I mean, I, I think you mentioned this before. I mean, it's, it's CRISPR, is, as far as I understand it, and I mean, I, I, it's, you know, whoever has gotten there first is then you, you sort of preventing the other companies from moving forward with it. And so the public interest factor, I mean, I thought Rachel's suggestions were very good about how, how the court should, should be thinking about the, the value to the public, but... Um, you know what? What, what does this, the public stand to lose from uh, from that? From having to go through the the patent hurdles with CRISPR? Um, uh, the typical public interest standard in favor of the patent is usually because people won't make the investment. This is a case where the public sector made the investment. I mean, the, the person that's holding the patent didn't make any investment. And in and, and the case of the Berkeley people, they got millions of dollars of prizes for what they did before they licensed anything. I mean, that's uh, so. Um, and they're going to make, but but there was no investment required, and it apparently it only costs about seventy-five dollars or something like that to use this tool. So it's a very inexpensive thing to use the tool itself. So yeah. the argument that there's an investment issue is doesn't seem well, to really the ring true in this. It's in the treatment, isn't it? I mean, the, the exactly. But the, so the people Editas was able to raise however much money they raised. It was a lot of money. Uh, um, because the Broad patents were supposedly exclusive and the CRISPR therapeutics and Intellia, there's hundreds of millions of dollars now because you had these patents to develop treatments. But they're not, but that money is not, that money is to monetize the value of the patents. It's not to develop products. And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that the people that develop the products uh, that, 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 that use the CRISPR technology into a therapy shouldn't be able to get rights that are exclusive and charge prices for them. But I'm saying is that, is that what is the public interest in, in, in allowing Berkeley and Broad to say, this person here can use those patents to develop in this therapy, areas, but this other person can't because we don't want them to have to compete against each other. I mean, it's in, it's in Berkeley and MIT's interest to charge really high, you know, to sort of squeeze, squeeze people as much as possible, but it just sort of slows down the development of new products. I, I don't, I don't, I, as, you see, I'm talking about the CRISPR patents themselves, at, at, at the ability to use those patents as opposed to the products that use that technology that go further. Because there, there'd be other patents that would come for the, the people that but would the use the technology. But the reason that they were able to raise money to... Who's they? The reason that venture capitalists behind those, the three companies doing gene therapy work with CRISPR, which is what those licenses are for, were able to raise money to do that was because they had what looked like IP that would exclude um, other people from coming in. That they'd have freedom to operate and that there wouldn't be other companies. So they could go to their venture capitalists and say, look, 
there are these indications, it's going to be hard to develop a treatment, but we think there's, only, there's going to be us, there's going to be these other guys, somebody is going to have to pay somebody else a royalty, but we need this money. So arguably without that, they might not have been able to raise that money to do that work. I can see your argument that that's not true, so I'm not quite engaging with it, but that's the, that's the money that it's, they were able to raise money to do drug development because they were going to be only, I mean, Editas, when they initially raised all that money, which was the biggest raise, was, say, was kind of claiming they were going to be the only game in town, and at the time had Berkeley in, too, and it was when that split happened that you got other companies, but there's a, there's a financial value that can be used to fund innovation. Now you're getting to the argument of is it is it better to have more competition and are you are you closing the funnel too early? <coughs> Jamie, I'm gonna answer I'm gonna answer your question and then I'm gonna fight the hypo. Um, so, to my knowledge, no court has ever and I this is easily Googleable, so someone should be able to falsify me like immediately. Um, uh, you can figure out pretty easily if the court has used the phrase by dole close to the phrase public interest in uh, one of these analyses, and I haven't seen it, but if anyone is on Westlaw and would figure that out, that would be cool. Um, but my guess of what they would do is they would just look to the purpose of the Bayh-Dole Act, where at the start it sort of says, you know, it's the, the policy of Congress to use the patent system to promote the utilization of inventions arising from federally supported research. And they would just say something like, and because of that, we're not going to second guess what they've done in enabling these institutions to have patents. Now, I understand what you're saying and where you're coming from. I suspect the problem, and this is my fighting the hypo response, is that um, you can point to the city of Milwaukee and say they're going to be actively harmed if we don't uh, in, if we don't allow you to use the sewage patent, but you can't point to anyone in particular just yet and say this is the person or group that will be harmed if we don't um, uh, enjoin this conduct, and that's a problem. It's just a practical problem that we have all the time in this area where the beneficiaries are invisible and that. Um, causes us to have difficulty in actually doing this. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify that. I was, I was, I mean, you could go through the uh, the, NI, the NIH or something and try and get a Barchin type remedy. I was talking about suppose that that they were not inclined to do anything at the NIH, which is, I think, historically what the case has been. The question is, could a judge then yeah. take it upon himself? Uh, it, it, I mean, if if on all these other cases they can kind of do the thing, it would seem to be it would seem to weigh move the public interest factor in a certain way if, if you were not looking at the patent owner having uh, paid for any, anything in terms of their own investment in the thing and, and had, had made no investment in the development of a product. And as simply as people, as you mentioned the eBay case, is essentially in the, in the process of trying to prevent other people from doing stuff as opposed to doing the stuff themselves in terms of research. I, I haven't, hello, I haven't seen, uh, just to iterate what Rachel said, I haven't seen any cases where the, the court looked at something that way, but there's nothing that I can think of that would stop anybody from making that argument and having that be a valid argument for the public interest. I, I, I kind of mentioned this very briefly before in some of the other cases, but it really, a lot of these cases turn on whether, you know, on what's been argued and what's been put into the record. So if, if, for example, that argument were made and you backed it up with evidence and the court would look at that and say, hey, that's, you know, that, that's a good argument and it could, it could turn the case, so. So I haven't seen the uh, UCB um, CRISPR licenses, although all the companies are public, so I assume they're filed and I can do, uh, and I probably will. But as a general proposition, UC Berkeley and their licenses have very sophisticated mandatory sub-licensing provisions to specifically address the issue you raise, that is that all applications for the technology will be exploited. Um, and, you know, Carol Mamura is a smart woman, and I, you know, she will fully appreciate the breadth of the CRISPR patents, and I can't imagine that those provisions aren't included in the licenses that UC Berkeley granted. Well, and the broad license to Editas covers exclusive, it is, it's only exclusive for stuff they develop. So if they don't do it, somebody else can do it. 
uh, Fred Abbott again. Uh, I wanted to respond a little bit to your observation, Matthew. From it's a technical patent law issue. Your friend observing, which I think is an interesting point, that a court would not make a decision in which a young child with you know, macular degeneration isn't being treated because the court's going to enforce the patent and they would provide a royalty. And you said it can come both ways. The difficulty, I think, and this is just putting a technical issue on the table, is that patent uh, cases usually or must arise uh, when the defendant who is suffering a legitimate fear of prosecution or infringement of the patent is challenging the validity of the patent being infringed by the patent owner. But there must be a case in controversy involving, depending on how you go, and this came up in the Myriad case, right? There was a lot of trouble bringing a case against Myriad Genetics because the alternative providers of the service couldn't demonstrate a legitimate fear of being sued by the patent owner and so forth. Without going into all the details, the problem is you usually don't have the party who is seeking not to have the injunction provided being an individual litigant such as the individual patient who will suffer if the patent injunction is granted. So it might be an interesting sideline of this to how do you actually get the public interest uh, party against whom the patent is going to be enforced as party to the litigation versus only, for example, a prospective generic producer and the, the patent owner. But that's one reason why this doesn't come up so often when you're actually looking at the public interest side of these potential injunctions. Understood, but I mean, the argument was, and this is a venture capitalist who thinks in very broad strokes, and his argument was simply, these don't happen. The experience of following companies is that these kinds of injunctions um, are rare. In fact, they do happen. Uh, it happened in the uh, Genentech versus, uh, what was the name of the company that was making the uh, other drug for uh, short stature? There were two drugs for... This is 10 years ago? More than that, yeah. but yeah, and it was ten years ago, and, and it was uh, it was it's not it was growth hormone. It was I think it was IGF one, but they um, but the you know there certainly have been cases where there were sick kids, and one of the drugs was told get off the market. So it it doesn't always hold true, but it's a bet it's a thing that you hear from people in industry as a as an article of faith as they're putting all their money behind something. Uh, so I would, I think Robert has, has left, but I would be interested in hearing from someone from Public Citizen, because I know they've brought some of these sort of public interest patent challenges or would like to bring some of these public interest patent challenges, but there are standing problems, as you say. Um, but I think there's nothing stopping them from filing amicus briefs or trying to get evidence you know, to the relevant parties who are going to say this is how many people are going to be disadvantaged or harmed uh, in the relevant case. Uh, there's also interesting questions, I think, about induced infringement liability in this context. I don't want to get too far into it because this is maybe not the, the room for that. Um, but if you take some of the 271B case law seriously and you say this is really about physicians doing something that's then being attributed to a company, they may have the incentive to get involved and, and say something. Well, thank you all. Our time is, um, we've actually gone over. Um, I hope that this has given you a bit more insight into what compulsory licensing issues are, and I think there's a lot of food for thought for the future in terms of how this is going to unfold in future cases, um, weighing the public interest, how to get public interest issues and ideas out there, and how to incentivize the, the drugs that we need to be out, that need to be made. So there's so many issues that I wish we had more time to explore and get more of your thoughts on, you know, what's broken and what isn't and what could be fixed, but um, our time is up, and uh, with that, thanks again to all of our speakers. Thank you.